Thank you, sir. Praise the Lord. Once again, I said, Praise the Lord. Nice and wonderful to have you from the morning, even till this time. I think you need to give a clap, an offering to the Lord for yourself. Praise the Lord. I appreciate your steadfastness and perseverance that you don't appear so tired and worn out from morning till this time. The Lord bless everyone. Father, we well, thank you at this time and bless your name. What a great God you are. You're good and merciful. And because of the blood of the Lamb, we have come into the kingdom. We pray, Lord, you energize us, empower us, envision us, so that this same gospel will take to the rest of our world. And that you will taste of the goodness and the mercy of the Lord, that you will be saved because of the blood of the Lamb. Keep us awake tonight as we go through your word and we pray your word will have a definite, positive, practical, pungent impact in every life. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. God bless you. You can be seated today. We're coming to, at this time, we're coming to Jonah chapter 3, and we're looking at it from verse 4. Jonah chapter 3, we're reading from verse 4. So Jonah and Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days. And Nineveh shall be overthrown. And then in verse 5, we're told so. The people of Nineveh believed God. The people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. Look at what God did in verse 10. In verse 10, it says, And God saw their works. He saw their repentance. He saw their turning around. He saw their willingness to drop all the evil in their lives. And then to come, peradventure, he will have mercy on them. Peradventure, the day of grace has not gone. Peradventure, they had not exhausted the mercy of the Lord. And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them. And he did it not. Today we're looking at the message, Redemptive Mercy. For the worst of sinners in every generation. In that generation, at that time, Nineveh was the worst of sinners. Nineveh as a city with all the people, the men, the women, the young, and the old, the, world, the, the worst of sinners. And yet in that generation, and in that evil generation, the Lord forgave them. And that means that whatever our generation may look like, that generation, this generation, any other generation, every generation of the world, there is the redemptive mercy that God gives to those who turn from their sins and they depend on the compassion and the love of the Lord. We're dividing the message to three parts. Number one, forthright preaching by a winnowed servant of God. Number two, faultless penitence with willing submission to God. Number three, fruitful pardon through the wonderful sovereignty of God. We come to number one. Number one is forthright preaching by a winnowed servant of God. We're looking at Jonah chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 1. The word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. 
this Jonah now, he had been winnowed. What does that mean? When you take the seed and then you separate the chaff from the real seed. And then the wind will blow the chaff away. What remains is useful, profitable, edible. And what happened to Jonah is that he had been crushed. And the self-will and the stubbornness and the rebellion and the disobedience had been separated from the real man and the wind, the great wind had come now to blow away all the chaff of his life. A winnowed man, a winnowed woman, a winnowed servant of God and now that was winnowed and was submissive and he was willing to obey the Lord. The word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Look at verse 2. It says, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. And then we're told in verse 3 that. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Jonah and now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey that he is to go through Nineveh and to make everybody hear the word of the Lord. He had to go through three days before he could do that and then in verse 4 we are told and Jonah began to enter to into the city a day's journey and he cried and said yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown number one forthright preaching by a winnowed servant of God. Three things we're looking at here. Number one, the 40 day probation before revealed punishment. Number two, the faithful preaching with a redemptive purpose. Number three, the fervent passion of righteous preachers. Look at number one here. Number one, the 40 day probation. Before revealed punishment, God gave a probation of 40 days. He didn't bring the judgment immediately. Isn't that what God does in his mercy? He told Noah there's going to be a flood and he gave a probation. He gave a period of time to give the people a chance so that they will repent. And then he sent his angels to Sodom and Gomorrah. Again, not 40 days now, but still a period for them to know that judgment was coming. And then he sent the Lord Jesus Christ to the people of Israel and he warned them. He said, the days will come when you will see the trench all around Jerusalem. God gives warning ahead of time. And for Nineveh, 40-day period, 40-day probation before the revealed judgment will come. Why does he do that? It's to give the people chance to think of their ways and to think of their evil. Look at Luke chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 6. Luke chapter 13, verse 6. It says, He spake unto them. He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. In verse 7, it says, in verse 7, then said he unto the dresser of the vineyard, behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down while combares it the ground. And then in verse 8, they said the period of probation and he answered and said, he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also. Cut it down. No, Lord, let it be there for this year also till I shall dig about it 
and dung eat. Then in verse 9, it says in verse 9, and if it bear fruit, well. It has not borne fruit all these three years. Let's give it a period of one year, a period of probation when there can be a sinking through. When there can be a turning around, when there can be a transformation, if it bear fruit well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it now, yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. This period of forty days, if they repent, if they turn, if they are transformed well, if not, if the day of probation, the period of probation passes by and they don't repent, then cut it down. We're looking at number two here. Number two is the faithful preaching with a redemptive purpose. Anytime we preach, there should be a purpose. Anytime we declare the mind of God, we don't just come to the pulpit. Teachers don't just teach. Preachers don't just say preach, and prophets don't just prophesy. There must be a purpose for what we do. And the purpose of God should become our purpose. It's a redemptive purpose. Let's look at Luke chapter 3, and we're looking at verse 6. Luke chapter 3, looking at verse 6. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. That's our purpose. All flesh, everyone, everyone that has reached the age of accountability. That is, they know left from right. They know that if they do this, it's against the word of God. Their conscience tells them. Life around tells them, and the organization of the world, there is punishment, incarceration, incarceration, imprisonment for those who do evil things. Even here on earth, there's a day of judgment coming, and the people that have come to know that this is how the dispensation of God, this is how it works. Then we declare the word of God to them. We still have a period of probation. And the reason why we are preaching is so that all flesh should see the salvation of the Lord. Look at verse 7. In verse 7, then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him. O generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come, the judgment to come. In verse 8, it tells us, bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance and begin not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. The period of probation is where the whole world is living right now. Your neighbor, in your community, your friends, your family members, all of us are living in the period of probation. And this is the time for us to turn. This is the time for us to look up to the Lord and we repent. And the mercy of God will come for everyone's salvation in Jesus' name. Look at number three here. Number three is the fervent passion of righteous preachers. The fervent passion of righteous preachers. Now, we know how Jonah went to Nineveh. He was, of course, passionate with what had happened to him. With what he had gone through, he brought everything he could bring within him. He preached with energy. He didn't preach as somebody sleeping on the pulpit and dozing on the pulpit. He didn't preach as if he had no heart, he had no mind, and he had no passion, and he had no zeal. He went through and he stood firm. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be 
overthrown. And the way we preach today, if you saw a house burning and you saw people, there were people inside, you'll not be lethargic, you'll shout. You get all your strength, everything you've got. You will want to speak convincingly and you will want to bring conviction on the people there escape because you don't have any time to waste you'll be fervent you'll be passionate because you want them to be delivered that's what preachers do that's what preachers ought to do because we know that judgment is coming with her heart with her mind sometimes with tears we're warning the unrighteous sinful people Come out of your sin. Matthew chapter 3. I will read him from verse 7. Matthew chapter 3. And we're looking at verse 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come. In verse 8, it says, Bring forth therefore fruits meat and suitable for repentance. Verse 9, it says, And think not to say, Within yourselves we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these souls to resolve children unto Abraham. Verse 10, in verse 10 now, and now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Trees in plural. The axe is laid on the, uh, at the root of the trees. What does that mean? What it means is here is a farmer. He looks at this tree. This tree is just occupying land. And the tree is not profitable. It's not yielding anything. And he says, now judgment has come. I'm going to cut that tree down. And then he puts his axe at the fruit of that tree. He wants to do some other things. He's still doing this, administering this. He's dealing with that. He's wrecking that one. The axe is there. If the tree adds any understanding, we know it doesn't have understanding, but if the tree adds, understanding it will know my time is almost up i'm about to be cut down the farmer has led the axe on the root of that tree is going to do other things as soon as he finishes those things he'll take the axe the axe is already there he'll cut it down and the tree is talking about us it's talking about man it's talking about woman it's talking about it was talking about israel oh generation of vipers who has warned you to escape and to flee from the judgment and the road to come and now also the axe is laid on the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is cut down, is hewn down and caught and cast into the fire. When the preacher knows that, and he knows that time is short, he knows that life is brief, and he knows that if we continue in our sins, the axe is already there. The judgment is already pronounced. The sentence is already given out. It says, because we know our period of probation is so short, is so brief, that's why the preacher will have fervent passion. Because he doesn't want that tree to be cut down. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord will persuade men. Knowing therefore the judgment of the Lord, the wrath of the Lord, that once it's appointed unto men to die, and after this the judgment, once I know that, once you know that, we go out to persuade men. 
Now, if you are talking about fire and you are smiling, that's not persuasive. If you are talking about judgment and you are also saying, uh, can you give me some money there? That's not persuasive. If you are saying that your message is urgent, if you are saying that the people who are listening to you ought to give an immediate response to the word you are preaching, and then you are, also, you are frivolous about it, that's not persuasive, but when you really know in the depth of your heart that these people, they are ready for judgment and their acts is already laid down there that if they don't repent, they'll be cut off. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord will persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. We're coming to a point number two here. Number two is the faultless repentance with willing submission to God. We're coming to Jonah chapter 3 and we're reading from verse 5. So the people of Nineveh believed God. They just they didn't only believe Jonah, they believed the God who had sent Jonah. They believed God had sent him. And they believed the proclamation that they proclaimed. And because they believed, the word was believable. Now, you understand that when somebody is talking to you, his body language can tell. The tone of his voice can tell whether he himself believes what he's saying or not. When somebody talks to you and he's talking about something you don't know, he's talking about something you have never heard, and he speaks to you, the voice, the tone, and the look, and the position, everything that he does, is not doing it just habitually. He's never been to Nineveh before. This was the first time. And this was the first time he was coming with such a message to any group of people. And he spoke in a persuasive way, in a believing way, that everybody could tell this man, this Jonah, the way he is talking, and he claims to come from God, God sent him and they believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. We're dividing this to three parts. Look at this. Number one, proper response and submission to God. Number two, perilous reaction of self-will against God. Number three, profitable repentance and supplication before God. Let's look at number one there. Number one is the proper response and submission to God. The people, you know their story, we've read up to verse 5, look at verse 6. In verse 6, it tells us, for the word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. He, he left the throne, he said, a person is going to die within 40 days, or sit there with the throne. The throne will not save him. The position will not save him. The exaltation will not save him. All the paraphernalia and the things that, are, are con that accompany the exalted position, all that will not save him. If he died on that throne, he'll be going to a lost eternity. And his cabinet came to tell him, a prophet is in town. And the word has come from the Lord. You know our wickedness. You know our violence. And judgment time now has come. And because of that, he rose from the throne. He laid aside his robe from him. And he covered him a king. He covered him. He forgot his position. He now covered with sackcloth and sat in ashes. Look at verse 7. In verse 7, it says, And he caused it to be proclaimed and published 
throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast hurt nor flock taste anything, let them not feed nor drink water. This is cereals that the king he had never heard a message like this before. And the very first message that he had from the true God, through the true servant of God, he responded immediately. How many people come to our fellowships, our ministries, our churches, and we preach and preach? We're serious about the preaching. We're passionate about the preaching. We're fiery about the preaching. And yet, they said, not now. And they go back home. And then they come back again. They will preach all our hearts out. We we'll want them of the judgment to come. They say, no, the judgment cannot come like that. And if it's going to come, not me. It may happen to other people. How many members of our churches? Any church, every church. How many members of our churches here and here and here until their gospel had it? Until whatever we want to read, whatever we're quoting in the scriptures, they know that already. Over and over they have heard. They may keep on like that, shrugging it off, throwing it off, throwing it over their shoulder to other people until the doomsday will come. But in the case of Nineveh, it says that the king made a decree. Nobody should eat, nobody should drink, not only that, Fasting without repentance does not bring salvation. Not eating food, but we are hurting people. Not drinking water, but we are hurting people. Drinking or not drinking, if sin continues, judgment will come. But verse 8 is wonderful. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, but let man and beast be covered or sackcloth, express your sorrow. Express your disappointment in yourself. Express the fact that you have gone astray and you have sinned and be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Now, let man and bees be covered of sackcloth. It's not talking about the bees in the forest. There's no way all the bees in the forest can be clothed with sackcloth. The bees living with them, they are pet dogs. They are pet cats. And the animals around them, they cover themselves, the men, the women, everyone in heaven with sackcloth. They also cover their animals with sackcloth. Why? Because that's what they can see. They could see those animals covered with sackcloth. Hunger might come. I see the sackcloth on the bees. And it might be that, you know, I feel so weak because I'm not eating, I'm not drinking water. And then when my mind wants to change, I see the beast, I see the pet cat and the dog covered with sackcloth and I say, there's a purpose for that sackcloth. I cannot eat now. All I need to do is to turn away from my evil. And then he says, cry mightily unto God, not unto an idol, because Jonah represented the God of heaven. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil. That's the secret. Let them turn everyone from his evil. You have sackcloth on, and it's a symbol that you are dead. And if you do not repent, that sackcloth will become a reality. You are gone from the earth. And when you go from the earth, there will be no drop of water to cool your tongue in that place you are going. So now forget about the water. Forget about the food and let them turn everyone from the evil, from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. That 
was the proper response of those Ninevites that had Jonah. Let's look at number two there. Number two, perilous reaction of self-will against God. Matthew chapter 12, reading from verse 41. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 41, the men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment against this generation. Think about that. We're talking about Jonah. We're talking about Nineveh. We're talking about Jonah. That Jonah became winnowed, wheeling, and he now went to Nineveh. And if we do not want the men and the women in a generation, as Nineveh will stand against the generation, Jonah will stand against the preachers, the pastors who have the key to open the kingdom, the door of the kingdom, and they hide the key. And they take life easy. And they'll not warn the people. And they'll not talk to the people. And they pitch the people the back. Jonah will stand against the preachers the prophets, the proclaimers, the reverends, the bishops of this day. And then Nineveh itself. Nineveh, they repented. They had just one message. There was no conference. There was no retreat. There was no kind of meeting. No other meeting. There was no melodious song. There was no stirring song like a choir here and a choir all over the world singing to us. There was no encouragement. There was no counseling nothing except one message with one sentence yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown the preacher Jonah he was a stranger he had never been there before he didn't show any love he didn't show any mercy he just declared yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown and the people did not take offense at his style the style of preaching that's confrontational the style of preaching, that's judgmental. The style of preaching, that's harsh. The style of preaching, that is inhuman. Uh -uh. They knew that their situation demanded such a preaching that they had no opposition at all. If they never repented out of that preaching, it looks like Jonah had not gone to seminary. I can tell. It looks like Jonah had not learned the mode and the method of communication. It looks like Jonah had not looked at the people, the society, and look at their faces and see the way to present his message. And yet that Jonah that didn't have all those good qualities and attributes, the people listen. If they listen, those of us who are now preaching, some of us, maybe many of us are refined a little bit. We've gone to seminary. We've gone to places of training. And we deliver the message in such a coordinated, organized way that everyone should reason through and accept. If he never repented, listening to a preacher that is uncoached. Now, those of us who are listening to the messages of preachers, talking about repentance, talking about faith, talking about salvation, talking about regeneration, we should have repented. That's why it says the men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here and you can tell christ greater than jonah in love greater than jonah in sacrifice greater than jonah in willingness to sacrifice greater than jonah in the power to heal and the power to deliver greater than jonah in his coming wanting to die the death of everyone and then if he never repented because of the preaching of such a man, what will happen to the people who are listening to Christ himself? That's why he said that the men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment 
of this generation. Let's look at number three there. Number three, profitable repentance and supplication before God. Profitable repentance. You see, profitable. Yes, because repentance wins the attention of God. Repentance wins the favor of God. Repentance turns the mind of God. Where you said he'll judge before, repentance will take the judgment away because of what repentance attracts. And because of what repentance does, it is profitable. Repentance is profitable to God. It's profitable fitable for us that we well, were going this way before we're wrecking and ruining our lives and our self-esteem was going with everything bad that we did our self-respect our self-esteem our confidence because it, we know that because of what we do we're less than human we behave like animals we're cruel we're, we're violent we are hurtful and we're harmful and we know what we've been doing all of a sudden something came on us we turn within us there is joy i look like a man now i look like a gentle man i look like a gentle lady now because the things i used to do i said bye bye i will not do that again is profitable my family my children that look at my life and they say that he has turned that he has repented mommy has turned mommy has repented her language is different a lifestyle is different a character is different a gentleness a generosity is now different is profitable to our children if daddy can turn if mommy can turn i think i have to be reasonable and follow daddy and mommy me in this way of repentance that's profitable repentance is profitable and supplication before god that is profitable look at jonah chapter 3 and i'm reading from verse 8 let every man and beast be covered with circle that the king talking if the king will say that he uses his authority in a profitable way if a father will say that he uses his authority in a profitable manner if mommy will say that he she uses her authority in a profitable manner the king said let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily and yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? That we perish not. It was accepting that our lives, our destiny, they hang in the balance because when the hands of God and what can we do we cannot give him money he doesn't spend earthly currency in heaven what can we do we cannot build house for him because he does not live in tabernacles made with hand what can we do we cannot uh, give him a cheap praise and give him all these uh, titles and dance and all that it does not yield to flattery what can we do the only thing we can do is that we repent and we turn and we stop all the evil in our hand and then you can tell if that thing alone that can catch his attention will make him turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that will perish not we will not perish you will not perish your people will not perish. Our members and our churches will not perish because they will repent as we tell them the might of God. And everyone that turns to God, all the earth shall see the salvation of the Lord. We're coming to point number three. Point number three, fruitful pardon through 
the wonderful sovereignty of God. Wonderful sovereignty of God. God is sovereign. He didn't have to ask Jonah. Now, Jonah, what do you think? These people have repented and these people have stopped. All the, look at them. Look at the whole city black with a sackcloth. What do you think, Jonah? He didn't have to ask Jonah. Why? Because God has the final say. God has the final will. God is sovereign. He's holy. He's righteous. He's perfect. He's love. God is love. He doesn't want anybody to perish. He didn't have to go, have to go and ask Jonah, what shall we do? Man and God don't have to come on a conference table before God can save the sinner. Look at Jonah chapter 3 and I'm reading from verse 10. And God saw. That's all he needs. He needs to see. He saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them and he did it not. Say amen. amen. Whatever I've been pronounced against you, you don't have to say why well, God is God. He has said I will die. Okay, I'm ready to die. Don't say that. Go to God and say, God, you said come and let us reason together. And as you reason with him, though your sins be as scarlet, they'll be washed white as snow. And though they be red like crimson, they'll be whiter than snow, as white as wool. He, he told the Ezekiah, he sent Isaiah, set your house in order because you will die. And Ezekiah did not say, that's all right, I'm going to die now. And uh, what do I need to give to that man, give to that woman, give to that tribe? And he said, no, God, let's talk about it. When you talk with God, God will hear you. And if you say, Lord, I turn, is it because of this? Is it because of that? And so, I surrender. I give up that thing. Calamity will not come your way again. And so, God himself turned. And what he said he would do, he didn't do it, do it again. Fruitful pardon through the wonderful sovereignty of God. We're dividing this to three parts. Number one, the promised pardon for the penitent. The promised pardon for the penitent. Number two, the procured provision for the pardon. Number three, the perpetual pact with purged peaceful people. Look at number one. Number one, the promised pardon for the penitent. It tells us in Isaiah chapter 55, we're looking at verse 8. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Nineveh understood that. The king understood that. Forty days. That's all the space we have. That's all the period we have. And at that time, within the 40 days, there was no procrastination. I'll do it another time. I'll think it over. I'll weigh the message. I'll weigh what I'm going to do. No, we don't have that luxury of time. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while it's near. How do I call and what do I do? Look at verse 7. In verse 7, let the wicked forsake his way. And let the righteous man forsake his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord. As simple as that and as profitable as that, let him return. Let her return unto the Lord and he will have mercy. Not that he may. He will have mercy. Mercy is waiting for everyone. The mercy that forgives and the mercy that redeems and the mercy that says, okay, I said, I'll judge you. No judgment again. We have come into fellowship together and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. That's what he did in Proverbs chapter 28, reading from verse 13. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. What he believe he called, um, you know, called Jonah, the king uh, is calling you. What did you hear that you said? 
I said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be destroyed. Why? Because you are wicked. Because you are violent. What if the king of Nineveh will say, who gave you that information? Oh, peace loving people. We're oh, nice people. We love strangers. And this is how our heart is. We don't do hunky panky with anybody. What if they rejected? There would have been no mercy. He that covereth the sin shall not prosper. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. And the whole church said, Amen. Look at number two there. Number two there is the procured provision for the pardon. The procured provision for the pardon. In Jeremiah chapter 33, and I'm reading from verse 8, it says, I will cleanse them from all their iniquity whereby they have sinned against me. I will pardon all their iniquities whereby they have sinned and whereby they have transgressed against me. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, and it shall be to me a name of joy. You'll bring joy to the Lord and a praise and an honor before all the nations of the earth which shall hear of all the good that I do unto them, and they shall fear and tremble for all the goodness and for all the prosperity that I procure unto it. Mercy will come. Love will overflow. Goodness will abide in your life. And the mercy of God will be inexhaustible in your life in Jesus' name. Let's look at number three there. Number three there is talking about the perpetual pact or purged peaceful people. You remember, in a way, you're violent people. And the king said, take away the violence in your hand. But now they turned, they were purged, and they were removed and released from all those violent actions. And they were now peaceful people. And the Lord saw that. That's what the Lord is looking for. You say, we meet the Lord. He is the prince of peace. And the peace of the prince should rule in our hearts. Are we purged? Are we pardoned? Are we forgiven? Are we saved? Have we turned around? The evidence of that will be there will be peace in your heart. There will be peace in your home. There will be peace in your relationships. There will be peace with the people who live around you. There will be peace with everyone. Hatred will go away. Bitterness will go away. And violence will go away. Because now God makes a, a, a perpetual part, a covenant with you that that you have the peace of God. Ephesians chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 7. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7, and the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and your mind through Christ Jesus. Amen. The peace of God in your heart now, in your mind now, in your home now, even your hands will be softened to slap, to fight, the peace of God has taken over. We cannot do that again. And to kick other people like we're kicking football, we cannot do that. And to speak slanderous words and the words that will hurt other people, the peace has taken over our heart, our mind, our spirit, our soul, our hand, our feet, our eyes. Even tenderness has now taken over our eyes. And I pray that peace of God that passes all understanding will keep your heart and keep your mind. And Jesus, the Prince of Peace, will reign in your life, in your home, everywhere you go in Jesus' name. And you become a peacemaker. And blessed are the peacemakers, they shall be called the children of God. See what has happened. 
peace has come in Nineveh, and peace has come to our community. So we we'll go out and declare the word of God passionately, persuasively, and the people who listen to us, they'll turn to the Lord, and great will be our peace, their peace, and the peace of God in our land in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, we appreciate the fact that you are a God of love, you are a God of mercy, you are a God of compassion, and you are a God of goodness. And we pray that your goodness, your mercy, and your peace will reign in our lives, in our ministries, and through our ministries. Amen.